Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Peter Gettler. He is president and CEO of the Cato Institute. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Peter. Great to be here. How did you get involved with Cato? That goes back to the early 80s. I was an undergraduate at MIT, and I was writing a paper on Social Security. So I went to the library. I was looking for some source material, and I found some material that was was uh, published by Cato, including Peter Ferrara's book, which the first, I, I the now first know is the first think, book yeah. ever published by Cato, Social Security, The Inherent Contradiction. I think Bose always jokes that we would never publish that book now. He was an undergrad or something like that, I think, uh, the guy who wrote that. But is that right? Continue, yeah. <laughs> but um, so that exposed me to Cato and – it's interesting because looking back, that's how I first discovered Cato and found out that it was a libertarian organization, a think tank. But other than finding the book in the library, I don't remember how I found out all the other information because now, of course, you get it from the internet. There was no internet back then. We had 300 baud modems, which I thought were lightning quick. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how I found out other information about Cato. But I, I thought about Cato and I said, boy, this is an organization you know, I should support, donate to. But of course, when you're – at the time, I was probably 20, 21 years old. You're not really thinking about writing checks to, uh, to nonprofits because you're trying to figure out how to make your next check to the bursar's office, which is <laughs> my you – know, putting you – know, prioritizing things. And then, gosh, it was around 2000. I finally have been thinking for years as a you know young investment banker, I should be supporting free market organizations, I should be supporting Cato, and I don't know why I was motivated finally to write a check, and so I became a donor uh, and got a letter back from Ed Crane and a visit from from David Bowes, and that was the beginning of my uh, my career as a Cato sponsor, which continues to this day. I joke that uh, you know. Bob Levy, our board chair, and Ed Crane and John Allison, my predecessors as presidents of Cato, won't let me stop writing checks. <laughs> um, so I continue to be a sponsor. I, th- I think that's important. I think it's important for you know, our supporters to know that Cato remains at the uh, the center of my own family's philanthropy. Making the decision to become the president, uh, to, were you? I, I, and it's more complex how the board works and everything. It's not like running for office. But mm-hmm. but at some point before that happened, had you mentioned to Bob or Bob leave the chairman or said, maybe I might want to do this or, or did it kind of come out of nowhere? Not really. I wouldn't say it came out of nowhere. I was invited to join the board by John Allison and this was in 2014 and I agreed to it. Even though uh, I tell folks that the you know the financial commitment that was involved was a little bit more than we were we were comfortable with, I knew that there was likely to be a leadership transition in the future um, because you know John Allen had uh, John Allison had stepped in in 2012 and he came out of retirement to run Cato, so it was probably a good bet that you know he wasn't going to be around for five or ten years, and that was really part of my motivation in joining the board was not to become president of Cato, but to have a seat at the table when we talked about it because I thought it was very important. This was really going to be the first long-term leadership transition in Cato's history. And I think the things that made Cato special uh, throughout the years, its adherence to principle, its commitment to libertarianism and to independence and nonpartisanship, I really felt that it was important that whoever uh, succeeded John as president of Cato um, really agreed with those those uh, principles, and that those were, uh, were were fundamental characteristics of of whoever would would lead Cato. And of course, at that time, I had no idea that uh, I would not have a seat at the table because I would have to refuse myself <laughs> for the for the discussion. I, I actually tell a joke that the the uh, board meeting at which I was elected president of Cato was my very first. Board meeting because oh, the really? pre- six months before I was elected at that board meeting, so I didn't attend. And so what I like to say is they told me to show up at nine o'clock, uh, and I did. And that's when I found out that the board meeting actually started at eight thirty, and they had elected <laughs> me president and informed me when I when I showed up. But but I told John that that um, you know being the member of a nonprofit board, is a, I view it as a serious commitment. I've been on a number of boards uh, over the years, including some in the in the Liberty Movement. 
view it as a serious commitment and uh, you want to be an engaged and contributing board member. And I told John that. And I've, I've told this story any number of times since I've been at Cato. It was uh, a few months later, I was at a Cato event at the Waldorf and afterwards John mentioned, hey, next time you're in Washington, why don't we have a meal together because I have an idea to get you more engaged in, uh, in Cato. And uh, when he and I had breakfast at the Henley Hotel across the street here, and he asked what I would think about possibly succeeding him. And, um, you know, I didn't have an ambition to be CEO of a think tank, but it was more a question of how much I cared about Cato and its mission and really trying to do all that we can do to maintain, you know, a relatively free country and a free world for, for future generations. It felt like... Um, you know, the call of duty in some respects. And I don't mean that in a, I don't want to be too dramatic <laughs> about it. But, um, you know, my wife and I talked about it. She was, I think throughout the process, she was hoping I wouldn't get the job <laughs> because she was quite comfortable in Connecticut with our life there. Um, but we talked about it and we just said, hey, this is, as, a, as individuals, as family, this is the most important contribution that we can make to, you know, advancing the principles of, of freedom and limited government that we really care about. And so we were, you know, we were up for it. Well, that I think gives us a good opportunity to pivot to Cato as an organization and think tanks in general, because our listeners have, you know, they know that the Cato Institute produces Free Thoughts podcast, and they've listened to a lot of Cato people talk about all sorts of topics over the years on this show, but may not have a good sense of what a think tank is as an institution and what it does. So maybe you could tell us a bit about. Cato and its role in the policy world. Yeah, I guess one of the ways to understand what a think tank is is to actually stop, step, obey, step back from the colloquial name think tank. Think tank really means a public policy research organization that produces you know, research on, on public policy. Um, I probably don't think it's the right way to describe it, but let's just start with the description of Cato and the mission that we describe you know, on our website, we say the mission of the Cato Institute is to originate, disseminate, and increase understanding public policies based on the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace. And our vision is to create free, open, and civil societies founded on libertarian principles. Um, I, I really like to distill that into what David Bowes calls the, you know, production of sharp, high-quality uh, insightful, principled research related to you know public policy issues of the day. You were discussing uh, a, a good analogy before we began recording about an iceberg, which yeah. I thought which I thought was a great analogy. I was actually just going to segue to that okay. because better I, than I, a dry definition, yeah. I think uh, a conceptual one is better. Um, I remember a few years ago, uh, Don Bedreau, the the economist at George Mason University, on his his blog, Cafe Hayek, wrote a really good, and I've used this several times, always with attribution, <laughs> um, just a description of what he saw Cato's role as, because he was commenting on you know, the important role Cato has played over the decades of, of his existence. And he talked about the difference between being someone who's orient toward, oriented towards politics versus someone who's oriented towards uh, ideas and principles. And he kind of said he was an idea guy. And the description he used is uh, of an iceberg. You know, an iceberg sits in the water and you only see very little of it above the water. Most of it lies below. And he described um, the fact that, you know, a lot of people are very interested in politics. I think that's because when there's a there's a uh, someone running for election that a person feels they support and, and is simpatico with their own views, if they contribute to that person or work, help them get elected, that feels like a tangible victory. And what Don was saying in this is that that uh, little bit of the iceberg that sits above the water is what's politically feasible at any point in time. So that if you, let's say, were able to elect every pro-liberty politician you could find, uh, that group of people could still only move policy so far in the direction of of uh, liberty and more limited government. So that the bit of the iceberg above the water represents what's politically possible. And the role of Cato, as he described it, was to push the iceberg, shift it, turn it, to try to expose other parts of it, to change the uh, 
you know, the, the breadth of what's possible, how, uh, how much we're able to move in the direction of more freedom, limiting the state, uh, et cetera. And the way we do that is really by trying to change the climate of opinion and the terms of debate, by um, trying to make the arguments with our research and other activities uh, to the academy, to media, to elite opinion makers, to policy makers. Um, about what kind of, you know, what kind of policy um, and really making the case for liberty in, in limited government in a, in a policy world. I think that's a really um, beautiful description of, of what we're, we're trying to do. And I think it also has the benefit of messaging to people that, um, you know, don't put so much faith in politics. Maybe those tangible victories when someone you support wins an election feels good. But what does it really accomplish? And over the course of my lifetime, I think of so many, you know, election cycles where either on one side or the other, folks who uh, believe in a more limited role of government in certain realms would get their hopes up only to be dashed later. And maybe some of those things we're seeing right now with the you know the release of the the uh, you know healthcare reform act yesterday from the from the Congress. The world's greatest healthcare well, of course plan is it's not being used <laughs> until it's officially called. So. Or as Michael Cannon calls it, he says that the Republicans have simply put a new coat of paint on a house they've already condemned. <laughs> um, so it really does show you what the limits of of politics can be, and that iceberg description really harkens back to uh, Anthony Fisher. You know, if you recall that, uh, you know, Anthony Fisher, uh, a great uh, champion of liberty who was instrumental in the founding of, you know, any number of think tanks and, and also the Atlas Network, which is an organization that, that supports free market and libertarian think tanks around the world, the organization I was, used to be on the, on the board of directors of. But uh, I think the story is that in the wake of World War II, as uh, the state sector was growing in the UK and uh, the government was taking over, you know, sectors of industry, uh, you know, Fisher was really appalled and decided that he was going to uh, go into politics to try to fight for, for freedom and a more limited role for the state. And supposedly he met with Hayek at the London School of Economics and Hayek convinced him that, you know, that wouldn't be – the uh, the most productive means of achieving you know his his vision and that it was uh, would be a better idea if he poured his energy and resources into um, you know think tanks the think tanks as a way to change opinion move the iceberg as it were and so he founded the Inter Institute for Economic Affairs in London in 1955 and was in involved in founding the Manhattan Institute and a CIS in Australia. I don't think he was involved in founding Fraser, but was involved early on in Pacific Research and, and ultimately Atlas. And so another example of someone who very much believed in the iceberg analogy. So a lot of think tanks in Washington are tied or I guess we could call it shackled to political parties, that their, their interests are whatever are in the interest of the political party that they're affiliated with. But Cato, we don't have a party. Um, there's the Libertarian Party, but we're not affiliated with them. Mm -hmm. But one of, the, one of the things that comes up um, when we're engaging with guests or when we get comments from people is libertarianism as a set of principles is, is a fairly broad concept. And there are – we'll just say there, there can be infighting within libertarianism and disagreement about principles within libertarianism. Um, and so you have you know, the wide range of on the one hand the, the kind of classical liberal, um, more moderate positions and on the extreme other end, you have your outright anarchists um, who all call themselves libertarian. So how does Cato deal with you know, where the – we're the big name representatives of the libertarian tradition within Washington. Um, so how do we deal with like what exactly we mean by libertarian and and the kind of conflicts ideologically and principle wise as opposed to just policy differences within this broader big tent? You know, I spent most of my life outside the liberty movement and as long period as a donor to Cato and other organizations but didn't consider myself necessarily an active participant in the movement and I was always um, a bit amused or maybe chagrined 
at a lot of the, uh, what I would say, pointless debates that go on. And I think that's a bit what you're describing, you know, these debates about, I've been at cocktail parties and I see people saying, you know, you're not a real libertarian because you believe this and I am because I believe that. And uh, I just think that there's so much that, um, um, that we agree on that um, there seems to be a predisposition on a part of libertarians is sometimes uh, because there's uh, a lot of folks who are intellectually engaged and, and, and interested in debate ends up spending, I think, a bit too much more energy on those kind of pointless arguments rather than kind of trying to keep an eye on the, on the big picture and kind of larger, um, you know, struggle between liberty and, and statism. So I try to uh, not spend a lot of energy in those types of arguments and try to discourage others um, as well. That might um, be the answer. Well, and I, I think really. it ties yeah. into the, the iceberg um, analogy as well because if we're, you know, we're locked in a long game here of advancing liberty, like we're, we're not going to win out and have Libertopia tomorrow um, mm -hmm. and we've got a long way to go and so it always feels like those sorts of disputes are disputes happening way at the, you know, quite a farther down the road to liberty than we are now. And yeah, we can exactly. all agree like if it's going to take a while, let's work together to push that iceberg bit by bit. And then if that happy day comes when we're at the point where like should the state do this minimal thing or this even more minimal thing, then we can hash out those arguments. But we're not sure. there yet. And that shows why you're the host of the, the podcast and <laughs> I'm only a guest because you articulated that better better than I did. But uh, I think it, there's some, it calls to mind some other things as well. Um, you know, because libertarians have areas of agreement and disagreement with, you know, almost anyone along the, the, you know, any point in the philosophical spectrum, and certainly with any government that's in power, um, I think that there are a lot of people in the, the uh, liberty movement who maybe relish being in opposition a little bit too much. And I think that this has important implications for our for our message. Um, you know, sometimes libertarians come in for criticism about being too um, too negative or too pessimistic. And one of the things that I really try to do is to um, take a much more balanced view because uh, things just are never that black and white. I mean, you think I think of. Uh, the way the world has changed since the Cato Institute was founded in 1977. Well, in 1977, you know, the government uh, told airlines, you know, which airlines would fly between which cities and how much they could charge and what uh, railroads and trucking companies would charge for freight. There was significantly less personal freedom from the perspective of, uh, well, I, I one of the things that's amazing to me is in 1986, the Supreme Court, this is, you know, uh, nine years after the founding of Cato Institute in Bowers v. Hardwick, the Supreme Court upheld the Georgia sodomy statute. And so the, you know, personal freedom has changed dramatically for, for gays, for, for, uh, for other groups. You know, there tends to be a lot of focus on economic issues where the picture hasn't been uh, necessarily a very bright one. Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that we focus on that is when we all get our paycheck, we wonder where the other half went. Mm -hmm. So it's natural, I think, as a as a human to to focus on on economic issues. But you know, one of the things that um, you know I I learned as a longtime sponsor of the Cato Institute and uh, the role Cato helped play in my personal evolution, person the evolution of my own personal. You know, philosophy is teaching me that uh, you've got to be able to, fo you know, to uh, to look at all aspects of freedom, and um, you know, keep a balanced picture of where some are advancing, where some are are retreating. There are elements of personal freedom where there, you know, things have been moving in the right direction. Um, it's obviously, concerned now with a change in administration, but uh, on a state level, a lot of very positive focus, I think, on the criminal justice system, uh, changes in drug laws. 
um, educational freedom. I know that uh, you know our education system, the government monopoly on education, such as it is in the United States, um, has created a situation in which you know none of us are satisfied with our education system. But it was uh, you know 13 years after the founding of Cato in 1990 that the first you know school voucher program started in Milwaukee. Now you have half half the states or more with uh, educational choice programs of varying qualities and hundreds of thousands of students studying pursuant to those programs. So that's some place where uh, things have been moving in the right direction. I also try to take some some comfort from the fact that, uh, you know, if you look at any long period of time, it seems like the planet is freer at the end of that uh, period well, of time than it is since, at the beginning. Well, definitely since 1989. I mean, between 19, yeah. yeah, definitely. You know, when you uh, – uh, I was thinking about, you know, Cato turning 40 in 1977 and if you Google, you know, 1977 Red Square Revolution Day Parade, you can see a pretty dramatic uh, example of how the world has changed in some positive ways. And then, of course, there, there, there are um, clearly areas in which, um, you know, the battle's been moving in the wrong direction, you know, the growth of the uh, – you know, surveillance state and, and um, you know, a lot of uh, concerns about uh, technology and privacy and, and um, you know, a relatively unsettling role of, of government there. You discussed in, how Cato in affecting you um, and your views. Mm. And when – I think you gave, when you gave your first speech uh, upon being announced president to the staff, you told a story about – David Bowes visiting you in your office after 9-11, uh, which I thought was a fascinating story. Yeah, I alluded to that when you talked about what, you know, what brought me to Cato and you know, when I became a donor. So uh, six or nine months after I became a donor, maybe it was a little longer than that, you know, I got a call or an email um, about David was going to be in New York and could we meet. So we set up the meeting and 9-11 intervened and the meeting was, I don't know, two weeks after 9-11. And the building I was in was the closest one to ground zero that actually wasn't structurally damaged in the attack. And David visited. We had a chat, nice chat in my office. And then I brought him upstairs to the cafeteria where there were these big windows that overlooked ground zero. And, you know, there were still dumpsters that said aircraft parts on the side and things like that. Still, still a very horrific scene. And David, we both talked about the uh, concern about terrorism. And David also mentioned being very concerned about what was going to happen to civil liberties in the United States in the wake, wake of the attack. And at the time, I thought, man, it's just not even in my frame of reference. And boy, looking back on it, it was quite a prescient mm-hmm. um, comment or prescient concern because when you think of the way our country has changed in the last, you know, 15, 16 years since the attack, um, clearly there's been, been uh, you know, much higher risk profile for civil liberties of, of, uh, of all types. I definitely wasn't thinking about civil liberties right after the attack either. So, I mean, it is uh, yeah. a lot of people even – Libertarians were thinking we got to go get them kind of attitude. So keeping that cool head is which was okay, important. you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, that balance it really struck me, and it, I really thought quite a bit about it. That uh, you know, Ed used to say, "Hey, all these things are connected." You know, our views on um, you know economic freedom and foreign policy and civil liberties and ec- educational freedom—they're all you know—it's all. You know, it's all uh, parts of the same common thread and I guess I have a greater appreciation for that now. That's, and I've said this before maybe to you guys that um, one of the things that that drew me closer to Cato over the years was I felt I was learning so much uh, from the scholars here and my own view was uh, was evolving. You know, I grew up during the Cold War. I had a much more, you know, hawkish attitude. Um, towards the you know the Soviet Union and the communist bloc, um, but uh, you know the world changed. And before I came to Cato and as a as a sponsor and started thinking about these things perhaps a little bit more deeply, uh, I realized my personal views weren't evolving as the world evolved. And 
I think that's one of the arguments that Cato was making at the time about how uh, you know, our relationship with NATO and troops in Europe and troops in South Korea, we didn't kind of evolve our own foreign policy and our f military footprint in the world for a, for a, for a change, you know, pretty fundamental change in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world and risk profile that we faced. So this is, as you mentioned, we're cel Cato celebrating its 40th birthday this year. Um, I'd like to point out that we have we have been fighting the empire for as long as Luke Skywalker has. <laughs> uh, but so in those forty years, um, I mean, there have been so there, as you said, there have been many trends that are in a positive direction. There have been trends that are in a negative direction. Um, Cato's been involved in a lot of policy issues and questions in four decades. When you look back at these forty years, our first forty years. What do you see as like as our greatest victories? Are there particular issues that stand out as something where Cato, you know, where we we won on that one? I think the greatest victory is the mainstreaming of libertarianism as a political philosophy, um, which is really a sea change from 1977. I think one of the things you, you uh, Trevor reminded me of my first day at Cato, my first presentation. I think I said that uh, speaking of Star Wars. You know, in 1977, you know, going to a libertarian function was kind of like, you know, taking a look at the Star Wars bar scene. Um, at the time I made that joke, to be honest, I hadn't I, – I, I've never watched Star Wars really? all the way through. But I have now at least seen I, the bar Aaron, scene. I, I just saw your heart break that from was, here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Would have made it hard but, for me to vote for you, President. <laughs> but that's an incredible achievement, you know, and um, – I've never, uh, you know, one of the difficult things uh, for Cato is that, you know, the things we're fighting are so big, right? The entitlement state and government spending and um, just the power of the federal government with, um, you know, meaningful budget, but still a small, you know, we're thirty million dollar roughly organization. That's a pretty, pretty big fight and a pretty big, pretty big mismatch. Um, and as I said earlier, people like tangible victories, like winning elections. And, um, you know, I think that that um, the uh, impact that Cato has had as a, as a sponsor, I never doubted. In fact, over the years, as I became more involved with Cato, you know, the organization ended up earning the largest share of my family's philanthropy because we felt that the battle was so important and that the, uh, you know, the, the mission was so important and that Cato was so effective be for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, the fact that it really stands out in Washington as um, you know, a very principled organization and one that truly is independent and nonpartisan. And I think sometimes people ask, oh, if you're, um, you know, if, if, if you're critical as we are of almost every administration, right? There, there are elements that we support, policy areas where we support the initiatives and the, the thrust of almost any administration, and there are areas where we disagree. And it's critical that we focus on the things that we support and have impact in advancing policy in those directions, but it's equally important that we um, try to get the brakes put on when things are moving in, in areas where things are moving in a direction that we disagree with. And one of the things I've learned quite uh, uh, quite clearly since I've been here because people ask, well, if you're, if you're criticizing an administration in, in this area or another, does that reduce your access? Does it reduce your effectiveness as – as an organization and, and the amount of impact you can have. And, and uh, I've really seen it being quite the opposite. Um, I think that, um, you know, really just in the, in the last um, few months when I see the access that people here have on the Hill and um, some of the meetings that we've had with uh, officials in the administration where I think what we have to say carries a lot of weight because people know that you know, we are principled mm -hmm. and when we have a viewpoint, um, it's going to be well thought out. Um, we're going to have uh, um, important ideas to add. 
in specific areas of policy. And you know, really, it comes down to a quote that I think Ezra Klein made a few years ago when he said that, uh, you know, I often disagree with Cato, but when they say something, I know it's what they really think. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But um, I think that that uh, really does set Cato apart. Um, I had lunch with George Will a few weeks ago and he sat down and the first thing he said, he looked at me and he, he said, uh, you know, Cato has never been more, the Cato Institute's never been more important. And he was, he was deadly serious and I think it was because he was a little bit exasperated seeing what you referred to earlier as, you know, most organizations in Washington, they line up with either the red team or the blue mm -hmm. team and um, they're therefore willing to make comp compromises to not criticize their team. And I think that that uh, can you know, dilute your influence and, and, again, make people view you through a partisan lens and, and uh, erodes the credibility that you have. And since we um, – it's really – I, I often say the greatest assets of Cato and it's a tribute to, to Ed Crane and, and David Bowes over their decades of leadership of Cato that we – you know, the, the Institute has uh, there's really significant points of pride that uh, we do tell it, you know, the way, way we think it is. Integrity, it's, it's like my dad always said, it takes a lifetime to build and seconds to destroy. And it's, I think it works that way for a think tank too. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think it's something that's, um, you know, it can never, that can never change. And we really have to have that commitment. And I think, I think we do. At the same time, we talked a little earlier about sometimes people enjoy being more – and it's human nature to want to kind of complain or, or whine. And I think it's important to uh, um, keep a positive uh, outlook on what we're doing and, and um, you know, being adequately focused on the areas where policy is moving in a positive direction and where we can help it move, you know, in, the, in that direction um, – you know, more, more uh, significantly. But um, you, know, you mentioned like specific areas of, uh, I, you know, we had a conference last weekend and I was thinking about just some things that have happened in the, in the last week. You know, we've got uh, you know, some interesting feedback from the Hill on, on uh, the fact that, um, you know, every senator was given a copy of our report on the TPP and it was said that, you know, this is a great example of, you know the work think tank should be doing to contribute to a to a difficult issue. Um, we talked about educational freedom a few minutes ago. I mean, Jason Bedrick wrote a paper earlier this year with a example of uh, really a new idea for him, combining you know the idea of educational savings accounts with uh, tax credit funded scholarships into tax credit funded ESAs. And there are now two states, Missouri and Arkansas, where there are bills pending. You know, based upon that that work, this the new administration that came in in January um, is, I mean, it's it's different in its policy preferences than administrations that have come before, but it's also different in its style and its tone, and it's the way that it seems to fit into the Washington system, including the think tank system. Um, so, does does the Trump administration change? the way that Cato operates or do we have to think about the way we've been doing things differently in this administration? I don't think it changes the way we operate because, you know, for the reasons that we mentioned, we still have to approach things as we would with any administration, um, try to make the most of areas of agreement and um, make sure that we're vocal in areas of disagreement. Um, it changes some of the feedback we get. Um, you know, because um, I think whenever there's a new administration that there's a desire – think about eight years ago. There's a desire to be hopeful. Um, you know, Give them whether, a chance whether the candidate you support has won or lost. Um, you know, one case you're hoping for the best and the other case you're hoping that the, you know, the worst outcome doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't come to pass. Um, so you've seen and, heightened criticism, do you think, of of you, of of Cato since Trump took office? In that regard, it's sort of what you seem to imply. I mean, I've seen it with like Alex. Yeah, and just the that there's, for um, um, you know, I get I get mail from sponsors or calls from sponsors, and some of them I wrote about this in my last bi monthly memo. There's some who don't think that we're you know 
um, enthusiastic enough about about Trump. Um, and look, I concede that in the economic realm, there's reason for hope. The the regulatory reform efforts, you know, feel pretty real. real. We're hopeful that um, you know tax reform can can happen in a way that that um, that is very positive. Um, we're still hopeful in the healthcare realm, notwithstanding you know the the bill that was was released yesterday. And so so we get all that. But I I think that um, you know most of our sponsors recognize that look uh, it's critical for Cato to say what it really thinks. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I don't think that necessarily shuts us out of the debate. And debate, in fact, it makes us. Um, you know, more effective in the debate because I think we have enhanced, you know, enhanced credibility. And also, um, one of the things that I should mention, in addition to, uh, you know, the commitment to to principle and independence, is, uh, you know, and this again relates to the the years of leadership of of, uh, of Ed and David, and which continue under John Allison, which is the commitment to to quality and uh, you know a high intellectual standard. And I think that that reflects very well on us so that um, policymakers, whether they agree with us or not, recognize that there is value to be had from engaging with, with Cato. How do you think think tanks might, um, might be changing? Because the, the model – some people argue the model is changing for a different time. We used to, as opposed to just feeding papers into Capitol Hill and you didn't have blogs, you didn't have uh, as many media outlets as you can do, you didn't have podcasting like we're doing now. Um, mm -hmm. is, is there room or time to sort of rethink how think tanks are behaving and trying to innovate into the future to maybe more public facing or different ways of reaching people? Well, you've hit on some things that uh, certainly there are, there are significant ways in which think tanks have changed. One that I don't think we have to get into maybe too much, but the, just the proliferation of think think tanks has been pretty pretty amazing. David Bowes and I were talking about that earlier. How it used to be, you know, kind of a few big players in town, and and now you know the University of Pennsylvania they they rank you know think tanks, and there are thousands of them you know around around the world, but You've hit on something that I think is really important. I think sometimes we get caricatured that, um, you know, I'll be speaking with someone who's, you know, usually it's a moment which which they're frustrated about the path of policy or the public debate, and they'll caricature think tanks as, you know, producing white papers. And when I think about the full range of our activity, you know, the you know, 15 or 1,700 blog posts we do a year and the 1,500 plus TV and radio appearances, the 900 op-eds and books and, and research papers I think are an important thing as well because, uh, you know, the way people consume information has changed, you know, people getting information from Twitter and the internet, um, blogs. But it's also important to have, again, that um, – you know, intellectual stature, that commitment to quality. You know, an analogy I often make is, you know, we get contacted by people on the Hill or people in presidential campaigns that want to know what we think on an issue or a policy area and they want to see some material. And you're just not going to – I don't think it's very effective to print out a bunch of blog posts to give them. I think you need to have some serious, serious research that illustrates a depth of knowledge on a topic in a way that, that really helps them. And now some of the things that we're doing to reach, um, you know, some of the, some of the stuff you guys are doing at libertarianism.org is just outstanding. You know, different types of content, the, uh, you know, the multi-million dollar grant that we got that um, I think you guys are really delivering on by developing, uh, and I think many of the listeners probably don't know about these things, but the suite of online courses that we're developing that's focused on young people and teaching them about liberty and the role of the state and libertarianism and political philosophy and economics uh, are just outstanding. And the, you know, marketing tactics that you've employed to drive increased, um, you know, participation, increased traffic to the site and increased use of these 
you know, really uh, important and valuable tools has been outstanding. I think the L.org, libertarianism.org traffic was up over about 150 percent last year, which is – is uh, is outstanding. Well, that's and a little bit interesting too, like li- the existence of libertarianism.org because that's clearly long game thinking. I mean, that's not policy papers. You know, it's, it's not, when we're saying, hey, you should read this essay from 1835, um, it's probably not going to get to the Hill and not going to be turned into a piece of legislation, but we're trying to influence people. Right. But that seems to be something uniquely libertarian. I, I don't think that the Center for American Progress has something analogous to libertarianism.org in terms of exploring the depth and the history and the philosophy of these ideas. Uh, that's a different thing for a think tank to do. Yeah, I think that – I mean I think libertarianism is a – there certainly is a an underlying intellectual framework for progressivism and for conservatism. Absolutely, but, yeah. But the way that they're practiced now in contemporary America, like libertarianism seems almost unique. In that we are, we're a set of policy prescriptions. Of course, that's what we write about at Cato. But we're also a coherent and long intellectual tradition and a shared set of mm-hmm. principles and values and ideas. Um, that I wonder, though, how much does that? Like, so one of the one of the big questions is if we like to say. I mean, we we like to think we're we're right in our policy prescriptions. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't believe them. Um, and and that a lot of the stuff that we see in Washington kind of confirms like, yes, we told you if you passed Obamacare, it was going to run into exactly these kinds of problems and look, it did. You know, like we this – we told you so is kind of a – I almost get sick of having to say it. Um, but if, if, the, if the arguments are on our side and the economics are on our side and the principles are on our side – And the then, history. And the history, then why are we still – the outsiders. Why are we still, you know, you can David Bowes and David Kirby do this I study. I think you that's know? the wrong way to talk about it. Okay. Because to me, libertarians are very much insiders because uh, people ask, when has there ever been a libertarian country? Sure. And my yes. answer always is the United States. Because you, when you read the Constitution, right, which specifies limited and enumerated powers. For the federal government and a very expansive view of liberty, to me, that's a libertarian document. And uh, I view uh, libertarians as uh, the heirs of the you know Enlightenment and the classical liberal tradition and the founding of the United States. And so I I think it's it's doesn't serve us well when we talk about it as if it's a new philosophy or we're the outsiders or it's about recapturing sure. the libertarian tradition of the United States and recapturing the libertarian meaning of the of the Constitution. Uh, but we hit on a lot of things there, so let's back up and and talk about some of them, particularly. How think tanks are changing, and maybe we can talk a little bit about you know what the future of of Cato holds, and some of the things that we're thinking about, you know, strategically, and how we can how we can increase our impact. But when you mentioned that was my liber- next libertarianism dot <laughs> org, and um, you know, it's it. I was thinking of the word entrepreneurial, you know, and that that is something that kind of runs through uh, to me um, libertarianism, and you know, many of the libertarians I meet, many of our you know, very generous sponsors or entrepreneurs who've built great businesses, and and uh, I think that um, we've had a very entrepreneurial approach to this organization as well. Um, you know, going back to it, its founding by by uh, Ed and Ed and Charles. Um, you know, the founding and building of Cato was was very much an exercise in in entrepreneurship. So I think that that's certainly you know an important part of the of the libertarian tradition. The way I think about the future and continued innovation, and we've talked about some of these things with respect to libertarianism.org and some of the other elements of media, um, internet that we're using to uh, to reach audiences, and I think there's more of that we can do. I think it's really important for an organization to stay focused and to recognize you know, what its model is and what the areas in which it's intended to operate because there's so much that's worthwhile to do or that needs to be done or that you want to do. It's really easy to fall into the trap of trying to do everything. And, 
that is just a prescription for wheel spinning, um, less impact, ineffectiveness. But I think there are a lot of areas in which, or a lot of assets that Cato has that can be um, be leveraged. Like we have this fantastic, you know, policy staff and uh, the human capital in this building that is, you know, a really valuable resource. And we obviously, uh, it generates a lot of product and a lot of activity and a lot of influence. But I think that there are ways we can think about increasing, um, you know, leveraging, you know, those important human capital assets that we have. And I think that um, what happens to a lot of nonprofits is that they want to keep growing. Um, and they usually think of growth in what I would call conventional ways, the way that they've always grown. So for a think tank, it's about, hey, let's raise more revenue so that we can hire more policy staff. And I'm not sure that's the best approach. I think over time, I, I think we do want to grow, and by growing, we can significantly impact, increase Cato's impact. But I think that there are ways that we could can uh, uh, grow and invest to increase um, the impact and what we're generating out of our existing, you know, policy staff. Um, maybe this is because I'm a former business guy, and so I think of things in you know the terms that a you know a, a, a profit generating enterprise would. But I think of of uh, you know the the policy work and the research we produce, and think about hey, have we? Uh, I think a lot of think tanks they uh, keep investing in policy staff and and generating more research and I think that there's a case to be made for um, you know investing a bit more in what I would call distribution trying to figure out how to get you know more widely propagate you know so, or leverage some of the work that you're you're doing um, I think it's important to recognize that again it's about turning that iceberg and with a 30 million dollar budget here in DC we're not going to trigger some kind of mass conversion exercise in the United States that's going to turn um, you know tens of millions of people into libertarians but we do have to ask our so, so that shouldn't become our mission but I think we can ask ourselves you know what kind of investments we can make in technology um, and um, again, leveraging in certain ways the, the work that we do, the existing work we do, which is excellent and high quality and figure out how to get more mileage out of it. So not change the mission, but kind of leverage some of the existing assets um, to generate a little bit, a little bit more impact. Um, I think some of the things that we've talked about, libertarianism.org, technology communications for the, for the core think tank activities, are examples of that, but I think that with the digital world having, and I think Cato is actually very good at that, and that's borne out by, you know, some of the surveys that we follow that that rank think tanks, and um, when you look at the statistics on, uh, you know, our digital penetration and um, mobile and and social media, um, it's really it's really outstanding. So I think that we're doing a really good job there, um, but I think that. Um, Hey, if we raise more money, would the next best investment be in? It would probably be in some policy staff, um, but maybe making some of these investments in distribution as well, and maybe thinking about um, some more inventive ways to leverage um, Cato's role in the movement and existing human capital here, and a lot of the contact that we have. With that. I was just up meeting with. Um, you know, Mark uh, and Katie who run the intern program, and we've got, I think, 1,350 applications for the summer intern program, which is amazing. And, you know, we brag about, wow, that's, you know, like 37 applications for every slot in the intern program, so we have a lower acceptance rate than Harvard. I think about that, and I say, okay, I don't care about the low acceptance rate. I'm trying to think, how can we leverage some more of those people? Um, are there ways that we can bring more of those people, not necessarily in as interns, because I think we have limits to the, we want to make sure that we create an excellent experience for the interns. And, you know, with a finite staff, um, there are only so many, uh, the, the intern class 
for whom we can create a positive experience and an excellent experience can only be so big. But are there other ways that we can um, can exploit um, that pipeline of talent that we have? So we've been exploring and you know, pat, you know, um, tossing around some some ideas in that regard. And uh, we're going to have an event in May when Cato turns forty, and we're going to have um, some leaders from the policy world and. Um, a lot of pro- presentations by Cato scholars as well, but talking a little bit about some of the things that we've been discussing here, what Cato has accomplished, what it means, but then also talking a little bit about the future, and, and uh, we expect to you know, more fully flesh out some of these some of these ideas as to how we can uh, leverage these really outstanding assets to create you know more impact in the in the policy world. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.